Hi, it's Brendan here. Before we kick off with this episode of The Brendan O'Neill Show, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who has donated to Spiked. Spiked is free. We have no paywall. Our articles are free. Our podcasts are free. Our videos are free. And we want to keep it that way so that our ideas can reach as wide an audience as possible. And it's only thanks to those of you who donate that we are able to do this, that we are able to have a packed website that is accessible to everyone. If you haven't yet donated and you'd like to, please consider doing so today. One-off donations are great and always hugely appreciated, but even better are regular monthly donations. Giving as little as £5 a month can really make a huge difference and help Spite carry on doing what we're doing. So if you'd like to donate, go to www.spiked-online.com and hit the big red donate button. Right, on with the show. We went into this pandemic hysterically terrified of climate change. The World Health Organization put out a statement in 2015 that the greatest threat to human health, health, nothing else, health, in the 21st century is climate change. Now, the World Health Organization's job is to keep us safe from pandemics. This suggests to me that in 2015, the organization was not doing its day job, and we are now seeing the consequences thereof. Hello and welcome to The Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill. This is a podcast in which an esteemed guest joins me to talk about the big ideas, the bad ideas, the problems and the controversies of life in the early 21st century. In this episode, I am delighted to be joined by Matt Ridley. Matt is a writer, peer and businessman. He has developed a global reputation as one of the smartest and keenest commentators on issues to do with science, progress, the environment and economics. He's the author of numerous books, including The Rational Optimist, How Prosperity Evolves, The Evolution of Everything, How Ideas Emerge, and his latest book, How Innovation Works. I talked to Matt about his latest book and about standing up for innovation and progress in an era of fear and low horizons. So Matt, I want to start off by asking you about your new book, How Innovation Works. The key argument of your new book is that innovation is obviously an incredibly important aspect of human life, possibly the most important thing in human civilization, human society. But also, you argue it's one of the least well understood phenomena. So could you just describe for our listeners how you see innovation, how you understand innovation and what you think innovation means? As you say, it's a very important process. It's responsible for the prosperity we have, without doubt. It's inventing new ways of living and new ways of helping each other that have enabled us to to live better lives. And when I say it's not fully understood, what I mean by that is that we don't really know why it happens to us and not to rabbits or rocks. We don't really know why it speeds up in some places and slows down in others. And economists have really struggled to get it into their equations. Mm. And for a while, they just regarded it as manna from heaven that, that drops onto the earth by chance every now and then. You know, oh, innovation. It's a fudge factor in our equations, which is not good enough. Now, Paul Romer got the Nobel Prize for trying to tackle that and saying, no, innovation is a product. You have to work at it and produce it, uh, and it then feeds back into your economic growth. So all that needs understanding on a sort of economics level. But I think also what I'm trying to get at is that politicians flounder around and say, oh, we're in favour of innovation. We're going to throw money at this. We're going to subsidise that. We're going to give grants to this. We're going to support something and something else. And they don't really know what works. And they don't really know how to pick winners and so on. And one of the mistakes they make, and this is a big theme of my book, is to think of the upstream philosophical invention process as the important bit, the only thing that matters, the the, the man who jumps out of his bath and runs down the street yelling Eureka, <laughs> whereas actually it's the hard grind of the Edisons and the Bezoses who turn inventions into things that are practical, reliable, and available to, to, to all people. That comes on to my second question, because one of the things I think is quite striking is that 
I think when people hear the word innovation, they probably think of the person leaping out of the bath and saying, Eureka. Whereas what you're arguing is that actually there's a distinction between invention and innovation. And where invention obviously is an incredibly important process, innovation requires a few more hands on deck and a longer historical process. So I wonder if you could just explain to us how you see the difference between invention and innovation. And to some extent, I'm imposing my own distinction here because the words have been used interchangeably. And someone like Thomas Edison didn't use the word innovation, but I would regard him as a classic example of an innovator. He's someone who took the concept of the light bulb and turned it into something that was affordable and reliable. And unlike the other inventors of the light bulb, and there were 21 of them, by the way, 22, I think, including Edison, who can claim credit to having invented the light bulb independently. I mean, it's an amazingly sort of ripe and ready to go concept in the 1870s. You, you kind of can't get through history without someone inventing the light bulb around then, which is kind of the opposite for what we think of light bulbs as being like, as being brilliant strokes of genius. But unlike the others who were involved in that, Edison then goes away and tries 6,000 different types of plant material before he finds the perfect thing to make the filament of a light bulb out of that will last long enough. Because he, the problem is light bulbs look fine for a few hours, but then they go pop or they fizzle out or they go change color in the early days. And he's looking for something that will glow at the right level for a very long time. And he finds Japanese bamboo and that that's his answer. So when Edison said invention is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration, I think that's what he meant. He's referring to the innovation process as opposed to the invention process. There's one other story that's very nice to tell, also from the US, which I think slightly captures an aspect of it. And that is the beaver and the rabbit looking at the Hoover Dam and the beaver is saying to the rabbit, no, I didn't build it, but it is based on an idea <laughs> of mine. And a lot of inventors sort of say, well, come on, this is my idea. I had this idea. Yes, but you didn't do the hard work of turning it into something that actually works on a huge scale. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that aspect, the downstream, if you like, side of, of innovation is often neglected. I've always been fascinated by the idea of innovation and invention, not least because my parents come from a tiny part of the west of Ireland called Derry Gimla, which is basically a bog land. But it's an incredibly interesting part of the world because two very important modern day innovations have their origins or at least have some kind of impact in that part of the world. So Marconi, his first transatlantic communications were done from an incredibly rural part in Derry Gimla, very close to where my parents grew up. And you can still visit the remains of the buildings in which he made those communications from Europe to the United States. And of course, this is also the part of the world where John Alcock and Arthur Brown crash landed yes. after the first ever yes. transatlantic flight. And in Derry Gimla, where my parents grew up, there is a monument to Alcock and Brown. There's an Alcock and Brown hotel. There's an Alcock and Brown restaurant. And they are incredibly revered figures in that part of the world. So I've always been intrigued by the amount of energy and hard work it takes in order to transform an idea into something that is a real benefit to humanity. Yeah. So I wonder, on that question of inspiration and perspiration, I wanted to ask you what you thought was the most important thing. Now, maybe this is this is not a zero-sum game at all. Obviously, we would not get anywhere without people feeling inspired and having those eureka moments. And we would also not get anywhere without people perspiring for years on end by testing ideas and seeing what works and what doesn't. Would you stake your money on one thing being more important than the other? Or do you think there's a very close relationship between those two things? I think you need both. But what I'm trying to do is redress the balance in the way the stories are told. Because I think we tell the stories about inspiration and we leave out the stories about perspiration. Yeah. Uh, and thereby we mislead people. And one of the ways we mislead people, by the way, is we then tell kids that there's this special thing called creativity – and godlike people have it and ordinary people don't. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, forget it. You're not one of them. You're not a god. Innovation is not achieved by gods. It's achieved by people who work hard. There's a lovely 
phrase I quote in the book about the Wright brothers, the man who took the photograph of them lifting off into the air for the first time in December 1903, he said, they were the workingest boys I ever saw. In other words, the the thing that distinguished them was that they just never stopped working. Yeah, They worked on Sundays, they worked late into the night, they corresponded with people all around the world, they tried different forms of gliders, they did experiments in wind tunnels. They knew that in order to get an airplane that would work into the air, it wasn't a matter of them just having a bright idea. It was them trying and trying and trying and trying, and eventually it would work. Alcock and Brown are a nice example of people who are rather forgotten by history – They're innovators. They're not inventors. You know, they didn't invent the airplane they were in. They didn't invent the airplane at all. They didn't invent transatlantic travel, you know, because liners did that. And I notice they they get put in the shade by Lindbergh, who gets far more attention for some reason. And he's nearly 10 years later. He's 1927, whereas they were 1919, I think. Yes, that's right. And I've never quite understood why that is. I think it's partly because they're not American. So, (laughs) you know, they get airbrushed out of history for that reason. But also, there's, there's an, it, it leads on to another story I have in the book, which is quite interesting. The attempts to get across the Atlantic in aeroplanes, it was so difficult and it was such a struggle. And, you know, as I say, eight years after Alcock and Brown, Lindbergh achieves it solo and that's amazing. But, you know, it, it's a bit of a struggle. And so the world concludes that transoceanic flight on the scale where you could actually take passengers as opposed to just the pilot, is never going to be possible. And so they conclude that instead, lighter than aircraft are going to be the way to do it. And so Britain in particular says, well, hang on, we're at the node of a big empire here. We're going to be the people who should dominate this trade. So they pour money in the 1920s into airship design to try and build transoceanic airships. And the Labour government comes in just after this program has started, and it doesn't like the fact that a private company is going to be building one of these vicars, I think it was, was going to be building this airship. So they said, right, we're going to start a, a state-owned company to build an airship too. So the private company goes ahead and builds the R100, which flies to Canada and back before the deadline it had set itself and under budget without mishap. The public company builds the R101, whose job is to fly to India. It's late, it's over budget, it's over-engineered, and it crashes on the first leg of its journey in France, killing 48 people, including the air minister. So, and Neville Shute writes a brilliant book about it because he was involved in the R100 program as an engineer, in which he points out that the government isn't very good at this kind of stuff. (laughs) Yeah, And Marconi is a rare example of an inventor who is also a good innovator, Yes, I would say. He really is the inventor of radio. Yes, there are other people playing around with it, but but he does an awful lot of the very early work. And he picks up on a scientific suggestion from a guy called Hertz that makes him realize that it might be possible to do radio. But he then comes to London meets the right people, gets the right investors, sets up a business and becomes a businessman and turns radio into something that actually works and eventually is made a Marquis by Mussolini, but he's probably not so happy with that (laughs) end of his career. Absolutely. And if you want to see these people being celebrated, you should go to a town in the west of Ireland called Clifton. It always warms my heart that these incredibly important innovators – who struggled enormously. I mean, if you read the history of Alcock and Brown and what they did on that transatlantic flight, climbing onto the wings to remove ice blocks and taking enormous risks to make this journey. And I think that really speaks to the kind of process that you speak about in this book, which is invention is great. Eureka moments are great. These are incredibly important. But the innovation process through which people take risks, exercise their freedom, and collectively work in order to make something happen. I think that's an incredibly important part of this process. But following on from that, one thing I wanted to ask you was, because I want to move on to the contemporary moment and how the contemporary moment grates against some of the incredibly important processes and and risk-taking and the freedom that is necessary for innovation to take place. I want to talk about how the current moment grates against that. I wonder if one of the problems is contemporary society does not tend 
to value commitment and hard work a great deal. So we expect instant gratification. We we expect the eureka moment to be the be all and end all of everything. And what has become increasingly unfashionable is the idea that you might have to roll your sleeves up for years on end in order to make something positive and useful and beneficial to humanity. Do you think one of the problems with contemporary society in relation to innovation is that instant gratification culture, the notion that you should be able to tweet or say or do something and you would get a round of applause straight away, grates against the kind of thing that you write about in depth in your book, which is that very often perspiration and failure, repeated failure before you reach a moment of success is a key part of the innovation process. It's an interesting point, and I don't think I do make that point in my book, that that the modern world is too obsessed with instant gratification. And I'll have to think about that. Now, you may well be right, but I see other forces at work preventing enough innovation happening today. And I do talk about how we are effectively in an innovation famine, not an innovation feast. Uh, And the reason I say that is because if you leave aside digital innovation, software packages and mobile phones and things like that, then actually this isn't a period of great innovation. We've seen very little change in transport technology in my lifetime. Medicine has actually not been that impressive in the last 20, 30 years, as we've just found out, because the ability to develop a new vaccine when we get hit by a pandemic is not as good as it should be and is not much better than it was 50 years ago. So I do think that we aren't indulging in innovation enough. Now, Uh, You know, there are lots of causes of that, but one of them, and Peter Thiel often makes this point, is that we've made it very easy to do innovation in software or digital. It's essentially permissionless. You don't need anyone's permission to develop a new video game. Whereas to develop a new DNA diagnostic device for a virus, you need to get the MHRA in the UK or the FDA in the in the US to approve your device. That's a process that can cost you many millions of dollars and take many years. Literally four to seven years is the average time it takes to get a new medical device licensed. Now, has that diverted people from medical devices into video games? I suspect it has a bit. And one of the things we have to think about is whether or not we need to to redress that balance. Now, during the pandemic, we have been very quick at approving new medical devices. We've got them through the process in a matter of weeks instead of years. If we can do that in peacetime, then we should be able to do that in wartime. So to some extent, I think I'm saying I wish regulators were a bit more interested in in instant gratification. (laughs) 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 Because this is a great theme at the end of my book is that The problem is not that government says no to innovation. It's that it takes an age to say yes. It took 13 years to say yes to the genetically modified potato in Europe that BASF wanted to sell. It took about as long to say yes to fracking. But by then, the innovators lost interest, the forces of darkness have gathered against him, and so on. Have you always wanted to visit a different country, but you didn't want to feel like an outsider because you didn't know the language? Or maybe you've been thinking about relearning that language you took in school, but you feel you just don't have the time to learn it anymore. Well, Babbel can help you learn a language within weeks. Babbel has a clear and simple interface. It guides you through your learning journey in a funny, smooth way. And it's designed to get you speaking your new language really quickly, within weeks, using just daily 10 to 15 minute lessons. Babbel teaches real life conversations. You learn through interactive dialogues. Speech recognition technology helps you to improve your pronunciation and your accent. The lessons are lovingly created by over 100 language experts and not by a translation machine. With Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. Babbel is available as an app or online, and your progress will be synced across all your devices. 
Right now, Babbel is offering listeners to The Brendan O'Neill Show six months free with a purchase of a six-month subscription. You just use the promo code BRENDAN. Go to babbel.co.uk forward slash play and use the promo code BRENDAN on your six-month subscription. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot C-O dot U-K forward slash P-L-A-Y and use the promo code BRENDAN. On that point, I wonder if there's a possibility that we get the technologies we deserve. So I completely agree with you. And in fact, I want to dig down into this a bit more later on. I I agree with you that there are too many delays and there's too much red tape and there's too many barriers to the possibility of invention and innovation. And it often gets held up as part of that process. But I wonder if it also says something broader about humanity's sense of itself. So for example, in the 16th and 17th century, when we had an exploratory sense of humankind, breaking boundaries, discovering new worlds, you know, the invention was ships that were capable of traversing oceans and more importantly, the willingness to take the risk of sailing into an ocean, even if you possibly considered that it might lead to the edge of the world and and you falling off the end of it. Or in the 1950s and the 1960s, when there was a broader sense of humanity's capacities, we had the space race and the rush to go to the moon and all these other wonderful things. And of course, one of the things that you write about in your book is the industrial revolution, which I think is key to a lot of this stuff. And, And we can talk about that in a bit more depth. And the creation of machinery, I mean, vast machinery that is capable of unlocking the heat that exists in pieces of coal, which has lied there dormant for millennia. And then humanity kind of taps into it and teases it out and uses it to create basically a whole new world. If you contrast that to the current moment where technology and development and progress seems to be relatively limited. I mean, it's good in a sense, you know, we have the mobile phone, we can communicate with each other, you can express yourself with your thumbs on a gadget in your hand. But there's a smallness, I think, to some of the innovation or the invention that is taking place at the moment. So I wonder, to what extent do you think the potential smallness of contemporary innovation speaks to a shrinking sense of humanity's ability to command nature control nature and harness nature to the advancement of humankind? Well, I'm a bit more hopeful about the present day than that, but I do have some concerns, as I've said, about how innovative we are today. You mentioned the 15th and 16th centuries as if that was a time when people were free to explore and brave and courageous and all this kind of thing. And yes, of course, there's some truth in that. But I quote in my book this guy, William Petty, another famous Irishman. He, when he was professor of anatomy at Oxford, he tried to invent a machine whereby you could double write. You could write something out and you'd get two copies, basically a photo, uh, you know, a sort of <laughs> mechanical photocopier and several other things. And they all fell flat. And he writes this impassioned, furious polemic about how in the beginning every inventor has to run the gaunt loop of all petulant wits and you know he's saying look everybody's against it you invent something and everyone tries to stop you why are they all so negative and around the same time coffee is introduced into europe and i have a section in the book on how this innovation this innovative drink was resisted rejected banned vetoed criticized by pretty well every regime in Europe, unsuccessfully in the end, but they tr- they kept trying. And there were two problems with coffee. One is that there were vested interests against it. So the wine and beer industry would fund medical research, as we'd call it today, to write pamphlets saying this new drink is very bad for your liver, which is quite interesting, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> given what wine and beer can do to the liver. <laughs> so, you know, paid for advocacy research is bought and sold has has been around for a long time. And the other people who were against coffee were rulers, kings and sultans and people like that, because they, they would say, hang on a minute, this stuff's being sold in coffee houses and people are gathering in coffee houses. 
and animated with a bit of caffeine, they're doing a lot of talking. And one of the things they might be talking about in these coffee houses is whether or not I'm doing a good job as king. And I've got a nasty feeling some of them are saying I'm not, so we must ban coffee houses. I mean, <laughs> Charles II issues a proclamation in which he says this very explicitly. He says, look, I'm banning coffee houses because they're sources of fake news. <laughs> so to some extent, resistance to innovation has always been with us and the power of vested interests and the power of special interests and so on. That said, you're right that, you know, when Thomas Newcomen invents the steam engine in the early 1700s, he's beavering away in Devon or the Midlands or we don't quite know where and there's no one knows about it no one can stop him Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth aren't around to to tell him that he's dangerous so to some extent innovation happens under the radar in the old days and it can't now and I think that's one of the reasons that it it has trouble now and where you have a point is that there does seem to be a very precautionary mood today that better safe than sorry has turned into a sort of ultimately precautionary way of seeing it that 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 we imagine all the bad things that can come from innovation and we ignore all the good things including displacing the bad things of existing technologies so the precautionary principle as used in the european union is very explicit about this it it says let's measure the possible things that might go wrong if you introduce this technology let's say e-cigarettes let's not take into account that they might displace cigarettes which are more dangerous Um, and let's not think of any possible benefits of this technology like they might reduce smoking rates so it does worry me that the West in particular has fallen out of love with uh, innovation. Now, to some extent, if you went to China in the last 20 years, I think you would find a buzzing, ambitious, world is my oyster sort of can-do attitude that is exactly what you were talking about with the 16th century navigators. I say in the last few years, because I have a feeling Mr. Xi is going to kill the goose that lays those golden eggs pretty sharpish, Mm. the way he's behaving in the last few years. Following on from that, I want to ask you about the Industrial Revolution, because you discussed the way in which, in some ways, the Industrial Revolution is the most important event in human history, or certainly the processes that gave rise to it, particularly the harnessing of heat, which I think is an incredibly (laughs) inspiring and bizarre process, that these are some of the most important discoveries and innovations and events in human history. And one of the things that strikes me, I've always been absolutely intrigued by the Industrial Revolution. I often find myself thinking, imagine if you were born just before or a few decades before the Industrial Revolution, and then you died a couple of decades after the Industrial Revolution. I mean, the changes that you would have seen would have been just utterly unimaginable for every single generation that preceded your own. And I I just think that's an incredibly important recognition and something that is worth bearing in mind. But if we fast forward from the Industrial Revolution and the importance of it to contemporary society, it does increasingly seem like we live in an anti-industrial revolution society. And the Industrial Revolution is now often explicitly seen as the cause of every single problem that we face. And if you go back to the 2012 opening ceremony at the London Olympics, <laughs> you know, there was a huge industrial revolution nod, which I initially thought as I was watching that, I was thinking that's quite a positive thing. But it then became clear that it was seen as the kind of harbinger of all the problems. And then it was the knowledge economy that rescued us from the industrial revolution. So I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about why you consider the industrial revolution to be so important in this process that you're describing. And the possibility that the turn against the Industrial Revolution is not a good thing. Yeah, no, very, very good good points there. Just back to the, the heat to work point, because I, I, I think this is central to one of my arguments. And I argue that innovation is essentially a thermodynamic process. That is to say, we use energy to create improbable structures that are useful, whether it be podcasts or machines, if you see what I mean. They're all improbable structures. They don't come about by accident. And to do that, you need to put energy into the system. That's the second law of thermodynamics, essentially. And remarkably, we had two kinds of energy before 1700. We had work, which was done by wind and water and oxen and people. 
you know, you built a castle with those forces, basically. And we had heat, which was provided by wood and coal. But there was no connection between the two kinds of energy. We didn't know they were both kinds of energy. We thought of them as completely different things. And along comes Thomas Newcomen, with a bit of help from Dennis Papa and Thomas Savory, I write about how we don't really know how, how this happened, but in the early 1700s, and he makes a machine that uses heat to do work. It uses coal to pump water out of a coal mine, which is actually quite a intellectual jump to make. You know, what do you mean you use heat to do work? How does that happen? <laughs> because we're very used to it now. And pretty well everything we do now is driven by heat engines, not by work engines. We're trying to go back to the medieval economy and rely on wind to do it all again, which I think is a mistake. So we're going to have to use the whole landscape and more to do it, and the enormous amount of material, and we get very little energy out compared with what we put in and so on. But leave that on one side. What that does is start an autocatalytic process. That is to say, each invention creates the possibility of the next invention. It sort of bootstraps humanity out of misery and poverty. And to your point, the idea that before 1712, we all lived idyllic lives in pastoral beauty is just nonsense. You know, there's a, there's a famous sort of survey in the 1690s, which reveals that a significant percentage of the British population starved to death every winter not just in a bad winter, every winter. In other words, you know, the casual labouring population in the rural industry, which got work on farms in, in the summer, would then wander the roads of rural England all winter, trying to scratch a living out of where they could, asking for work, not on the whole getting it, and a significant number of them would simply die by the roadside. Now, that's not great, and nor is people working in human hours in, in factories a century later. But it's not necessarily clear that one is worse than the other. They're both bad compared with what we've achieved now. The Industrial Revolution is a misnomer in one sense, is in that it's not a, a revolution. There isn't a, a sort of before and after moment, despite what you said, and quite rightly, about how incredible changes happened within an individual's lifetime. I mean, I often think the steam locomotive must have been an extraordinary thing to come across for the first time. You know, what you mean you can go 25 miles an hour forever <laughs> or, you know, for a long, you know, without sitting on a galloping horse. That's extraordinary. So the Industrial Revolution gathers pace very slowly and then it slowly begins to accelerate. And you can see this in wages. You can see it in economic growth rates. Uh, you can see it in technologies, etc. You know, the really fast change is not till well into the 19th century. And even then, it's pretty slow compared with what you get in the 20th century and so on. And lots of industrial revolutions had started and failed. So the Chinese one in, in the Song Dynasty of 1000, various Italian things in the Middle Ages, uh, and the the low countries in the sort of 1600s, you know, had had what were essentially industrial revolutions. In my view, they ran out of energy. They, they, they couldn't find coal. The Dutch may do with peat for a while. But it, that, in my view, the energy is the key to it. But I might be wrong about that. I've had I've had arguments with economic historians like Deirdre McCloskey about this. Um, she thinks that what kept it going in this country was that we valued innovation, that we respected people who tried to change things. And there's some truth in that too. But we are astonishingly ignorant about the Industrial Revolution. We think in a sort of Dickensian way mm -hmm. that a beautiful medieval idyll was plunged into a smoky nastiness in which people were suddenly horrible to each other for the first time. You know, I'm sorry, but the Victorian factory owner working his workers hard in smoky cities was nothing like as nasty to people as the feudal baron in 1100 chopping their heads off whenever he felt like it. And raping, and raping their daughters and all this kind of thing. So, so yeah, he's not great by today's standards, but he was a lot better than what went before. I actually think that's an, an incredibly important point. And one of the things that strikes me about the Industrial Revolution, which I wanted to ask you about in relation to innovation more broadly, is the, the often unintended consequences of innovation. So one of the unintended consequences of the Industrial Revolution is actually democracy – mass education, city life, 
museums. I mean, everything, you can list them off. If you look at what happened in the 18th and 19th centuries and, and then right into the Victorian era, you have a situation where if you drag people from the country, from, you know, under the jackboot of their feudalistic overlords, drag them into city life, push them into factories and force them to work incredibly difficult hours, including children as well. All of those things that we can all agree in the 21st century are a bad thing to have done. But one of the knock-on effects of that is that you throw people together. You have a situation where people start saying, well, what shall we do with our children if they don't work? What is the pastime that people are allowed to have in cities? Should we have the right to vote in these situations now that we've been thrown together in these these new cities, these smog-filled cities of industry and, and innovation and transport? So I think one of the enormously positive things about innovation is very often the kind of unintended knock-on consequences of alerting people to the possibility that life can be better, their situation can be improved, and politics itself can move in a positive direction. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right there. And you know, an even more striking example in some ways is the mechanization of housework in the middle of the 20th century. So the arrival of the vacuum cleaner, the dishwasher, the clothes washing machine, particularly the clothes washing machine, liberates women on a spectacular scale. Now, you might say, well, why on earth should poor women have had to be doing this work beforehand? But that was what was happening. So it is no accident that women's liberation follows from this reduction in the amount of time you have to spend doing housework. But there are also negative unintended consequences of innovation, and I don't shy away from them in the book. So the one that's very striking, I think, today is the effect of communication technologies on politics. Mm. So the invention of radio, I'm pretty sure, played a very large part in the rise of the dictators in the 1920s. You know, Marconi leads to Mussolini, (laughs) as it were. And you can find this very explicitly in the degree to which the fascists and their like used radio and saw the importance of it. You can see it showing up in election results in Germany in the late 1920s and so on. You know, where people have radios, they start to get hotted up by Hitler. And what's the one thing that Oswald Mosley's wife, Diana, asks Hitler for when she goes to see him? Money to fund a radio station for the British Union of Fascists. So, you know, radio is lovely. I love radio, but it probably helped plunge the world into fascism and communism to some extent. Like, Is there an echo of that happening today where social media has completely upset the way in which we communicate news and other things, has, to my surprise, and I must admit I was a bit of a utopian about this, I thought once we had the internet and we could look up anything, we'd all see each other's point of view, has social media polarized the world politically in a way that is quite scary. And Donald Trump is the sort of natural consequence of social media, you could argue. He couldn't have happened without it. It's a bit like what printing did in the 1500s, where Martin Luther is a terrific innovator, by the way. He's the most published author in Europe by a mile. He realizes the value of print, the importance of print, the opportunity that print enables him to have, and he uses it to stir up what pretty soon turns into a endless religious warfare. You know, he's doing it for some good motives too. He, you know, he's trying to point out that the Catholic Church is behaving badly as well. So I'm not, I'm not trying to take sides in in, in the Reformation <laughs> <laughs> at this point. Uh, I'm just trying to look at the the impact of technological change on non-technological things. And I think that is a really interesting area. I agree. Uh, specifically on that issue, do you think that technological change is the thing that, that encourages the sometimes problematic shifts in society? Or do you think they were already there and technological change just kind of molded itself around them? So one of the things I think in, in relation to contemporary society, and I share your concerns about social media and its influence on political life, and perhaps if we went back 
70 years or 80 years or 90 years, we might have had similar concerns about radio or television in relation to politics. But is it possible that politics was already going in that in that direction and that social media simply molded itself around it? So for example, if you look at the tendency of politicians to speak in sound bites, to to dumb down, to perceive of the public as, you know, not capable of anything more than a kind of one sentence slogan. You're absolutely right. Do you think that. technology is to blame for that or did technology simply massage itself around what already existed? You're you're dead right to, to make that point because cause and effect is often very confusing in these areas. And we start with an assumption that we're looking at the cause and that's the effect. And it might well be the other way around. And you're dead right that, uh, you know, 40 years ago, it wasn't the golden age of, you know, long Shakespearean speeches in political rallies. It was already a period of television sound bites. I know this firsthand. I covered a American presidential election as a journalist for a whole cycle, 1988. And, you know, that was, we all agreed at the time, the most disgracefully sound bitey, unfair, taking out quotes out of context sort of campaign run by George H.W. Bush against Michael Dukakis, and to some extent vice versa, that we could imagine, you know, that it, I don't know if the name Willie Horton means anything to you, a prisoner who was furloughed by Michael Dukakis when he was governor of Massachusetts, who went on to murder someone else. And, you know, this case was hung around Dukakis's neck by the Bush campaign relentlessly and for months on end in a pretty unfair way. That's not exactly the Federalist Papers, is it, <laughs> in terms of elections? So I think, I think you're absolutely right. We, if we don't invent social media, we still find that politics is getting shorter and nastier and more glib and more superficial. And does social media just enable, encourage that? We also, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm a fan of social media. I use social media. I actually like the fact that I can access a more balanced range of news from Twitter than I can from the BBC, frankly, I'm sorry to say, you know, and I have liked the BBC at times in the past, but it, it now has a pretty tiresome filter of telling me what it thinks I should hear, whereas Twitter on the whole doesn't. Yes, lots of individuals on Twitter do, but if I know how to graze on Twitter, I can find all sorts. And I, you know, I find obscure articles in obscure places. And so I'm really glad that the media has been disintermediated and that I can come across spiked as well as uh, the BBC. There are so many benefits to lifelong learning. That's why I love The Great Courses Plus. You can expand your curious mind, build upon your skills, improve your memory and self-confidence. The list goes on. Created for the lifelong learner in all of us, this streaming service provides access to thousands of fascinating fact-based lectures across almost any topic imaginable. They are taught by world-leading professors and experts, and you can explore topics like human personality, world history, and even get tips on time management or learn how to cook. And with the Great Courses Plus app, it's easy to watch or listen anytime, anywhere. It's great for any age, secondary school or university students, and for families too. I recommend checking out the course Foundations of Western Civilization 2, A History of the Modern Western World. This course covers a huge breadth of European history, from Renaissance humanism to the Protestant Reformation, from the rise of fascism and communism to the eastward expansion of the European Union. So continue your journey as a lifelong learner today. Sign up for The Great Courses Plus. And right now, they're offering my listeners this time-limited deal, a free month of access to their entire library. But to start your free month trial, you must sign up today using this special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Brendan. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Brendan. One of the best things about the internet revolution is that it is very reminiscent of the printing press revolution. If anything, it's even more radical in the sense that it has granted 
vastly more people the the power and the freedom Absolutely. to publish their thoughts without having to worry about the guardians of correct thinking or editors or priests or anyone else who might previously have told us what we can and cannot publish and how we can and cannot publish things. One thing I wanted to ask you about specifically was the role of environmentalism or climate change alarmism in some of the anti-innovation trends. You and I are both pro-innovation, pro-progress we would both call ourselves rational optimists, I think, to borrow a title from uh, uh, one of your earlier books. And I think both of us are concerned about the role that environmentalism or, or climate change alarmism, the role that that plays in holding back or or constantly calling into question the importance of progress and and of industry and of innovation and it strikes me that climate change alarmism is is very often very clearly a a repudiation of you know some of the most important leaps forward of the past couple of hundred years you know it's anti industry it's anti industrial revolution so I just wanted to ask you specifically about what role you think this kind of eco-politics, this eco-fear-mongering plays in terms of uh, thwarting innovation or at least slowing down progress in the 21st century. Well, if you ask a somebody from an environmental pressure group, are you against innovation? They will say, no, certainly not. Of course I'm in favour of innovation. We must have new solar panels and new wind turbines. And yet the mask slips quite often. You know, you get Extinction Rebellion people, but not just them. Lots of people saying it's really disgraceful that people go on holiday. We can't have these new cars because they go too fast or uh, people might enjoy themselves in them. You know, and and the, the old Puritan instinct that somebody somewhere might be enjoying themselves and that's a disaster, you know, comes out. And you hear this all the time. And by the way, when they do like innovation, they often like forcing innovations on us that we don't want. So the diesel revolution was driven by environmentalists, let's not forget. And the compact fluorescent bulb was forced on us. They came along and said, you can't use incandescent bulbs. Here's a more efficient one. Sure, it's more expensive and it doesn't light up so fast and it gives a nasty yellow light and it's full of mercury. So when you drop it, you've got to bring in toxicologists to clean your house or whatever it might be. But nonetheless, we're going to ban the other technology. So you must adopt this technology. And we all said, and we hoarded incandescent bulbs in our lifetime. And within 10 years, we were proved right because there was another technology in the wings, the LED, which is much better, much more efficient in terms of use of energy, much more easy to use, etc., and was getting cheaper all the time. If we had not gone down the diversion into compact fluorescent bulbs, we'd have developed LEDs quicker, we'd have actually saved more energy, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So in terms of picking winners, the environmentalists often have a poor track record. But just back to whether they're anti-innovation generally, ask yourself this question. If tomorrow, in my secret laboratory in the heart of the volcano behind my house, I developed a form of fusion energy that deli- that was extremely cheap and extremely abundant. All I need is 10 pints of water a year, and I can give you enough energy to power five cities. I'll give it away to you for free. There's no patents on it. All you do is plug in. Energy is essentially as cheap as Wi-Fi is. You know, so in other words, we're off to the races with wholly abundant, cheap energy. What would the reaction of the environmental lobby be? Would they say, oh, fine, so no emissions? Well, then let's fly as far as we like. Let's drive as much as we want. Let's build whatever we want. Let's uh, leave the standby button on on our television as long as we want because electricity is free. No, they would clearly say, oh, my God, this is a disaster. People are going to go on holiday even more and so on. And we know this because actually they've said this in the time. Emery Lovins, a famous sort of founder of the environmental movement, said giving cheap energy to humanity is like giving a loaded gun to a child. It's a pretty weird thing to say when you think about it. So I'm sorry, you know, a lot of the instinct here is that a lot of environmental, particularly climate change alarmism, is not driven by genuine concern about the climate. A lot of it is driven by genuine concern about the fact that someone somewhere might be enjoying themselves too much or might have too fast a car or something like that. 
Following on from that, I want to ask you about nuclear power. Now, you, you've written extensively about nuclear power. Many uh, writers have pointed out how wonderful and amazing nuclear power could be in terms of solving some of our resource crises. Uh, but it's it's very striking that lots of Greens, lots of environmentalists, lots of climate change alarmists are still very anti nuclear. Now, there are some pro-nuclear power greens, there are some modernist greens, and I think they are very interesting. Uh, but for the most part, the, the, the leading climate change alarmists, the leading environmentalist spokespeople are anti-nuclear power, despite the fact that it is well known that nuclear power allows us to do an enormous amount of uh, stuff with a very small amount of stuff. And uh, also the waste is is relatively easily dealt with. This is an, an energy source that, that could radically transform human society if its full potential was unleashed. The anti-nuclear sentiment among Greens is one issue where it becomes increasingly clear that what is motoring Greens is not really a, a kind of reasoned science-led discussion about how we might best use nature's resources for the benefit of mankind, but really it's just an opposition to human interference in nature full stop. And I think what their opposition to nuclear power really sums that up because what they're essentially saying is it's too dangerous to do this. We can't possibly meddle with this source of energy. It's too reckless. Too many bad things will happen. And it really is just a warning sign that they put up against human meddling in nature at all and against our use of natural resources in more and more imaginative ways. So I wonder what you think that that attitude to nuclear power tells us about the broader green agenda or the anti-innovation agenda today. You're absolutely right. You show me somebody who's very alarmed about climate. And by the way, I'm not here saying that climate doesn't change. Of course it does, or that humans are involved, or that it might be a problem in the long run. Uh, you know, I, I'm way in the middle of the consensus on all those questions. Show me somebody who who is very, very alarmed about it, who says, you know, we're going to be eating our own babies in 10 years' time. You know, that's the kind of thing Extinction Rebellion was saying at the beginning of this year. Let's not forget. And then ask them, are you in favour of nuclear power? And if they say, no, I'm against nuclear power too, then they're a hypocrite, frankly, because this is the only technology that can provide the energy for civilization on a scale Wind and solar and so on, they're never going to get there. They're a tiny smudge on the horizon of, of this issue. They're barely keeping up with the increase in electricity demand, let alone uh, eating into it, if you see what I mean. But nuclear power is currently a declining technology. Its contribution to the world energy system is going down, not up. Why is this? Essentially, I argue in the book, it's because it has been cut off from the process of innovation. It is not allowed to innovate. And what I mean by that is that we are frozen with late 1950s versions of nuclear power stations in which you basically use uranium to boil a kettle. And this has all sorts of disadvantages, including the fact that when you boil a kettle, you get steam. Steam isn't so good at conducting heat as water is. And so suddenly the thing can go into meltdown and, you know, actually be quite dangerous. What we need to do is move to much more inherently safe forms of nuclear power using basically the molten salt cycle or, you know, there are lots of other different versions that were even built as prototypes, which would be far, far safer, far more efficient, et cetera, et cetera. Why doesn't that happen? Entirely because of regulation. The way government regulates nuclear power is essentially the way Pharaohs built pyramids. Each one must be licensed from start to finish by a regulatory authority before you start building. Every screw and where it's going to go has to be approved in advance. Well, you can't innovate that way. You can't change your mind as you're going along. You can't say somebody's got a slightly better form of steel. We're going to use that instead. You can't say what we found that on our drawing, actually, would be better to have this be a little bit bigger and that be a little bit smaller. That's the kind of process that you need. So you've got these incredibly expensive, hundreds of millions of dollars licensing approval processes which mitigate against any kind of innovation. Now, there's one country, and I've only learned this recently, that is trying to solve that problem. Canada has an approach to nuclear regulation that is basically principles-based rather than 
rules based. It's it basically says, you know, show me the outcome, not how you get to the outcome. And if if you can show me it's safe, et cetera, et cetera, then we'll license you in principle and you can then go out and as long as you're achieving this, you can do it. And as a result, there's been a rush, a gold rush of nuclear technology companies to Canada to try to get their designs approved in Canada and built in Canada so they can then go to the rest of the world and say, look, it's working, it's safe in Canada, etc. It's a very interesting concept. And there are several molten salt reactors that may well be up and operating in Canada by the end of this decade or slightly sooner. So we might be able to unblock that logjam. But I didn't really get to your point about what the opposition to nuclear power tells you about environmentalists. But I'm afraid the rhetoric about climate change got unbelievably foolish, particularly at the start of this year. You know, let's, let's not forget, we went into this pandemic hysterically terrified of climate change, which is, let's face it, the fact that by the 2060s and 2070s, the average temperature of the world, more at night and in winter and in the north than in the south and in the daytime and in summer, will be a couple of degrees warmer, which, by the way, most of our cities are a couple of degrees warmer than the surrounding countryside already, because that's called the urban heat island effect. It's nothing to do with global warming. You know, by the time my grandchildren are around, there's going to be a slightly less cold winters. That's essentially all we're saying at night time, right? Daytime is not going to be much different, but nighttime is going to be significantly less cold. So you might not die on the streets of Montreal if you drop your keys and you can't get into your house in January in future. How did we manage to get to the point where we thought that that is way and above all other scares so that we neglected the pandemic threat for a start? The World Health Organization put out a statement in 2015 that the greatest threat to human health, health, nothing else, health, in the 21st century is climate change. Now, the World Health Organization's job is to keep us safe from pandemics. This suggests to me that in 2015, the organization was not doing its day job, and we are now seeing the consequences thereof. I thought the the start of the pandemic was a very good example of the, how the fashion for apocalypticism can actually distract human attention from things that are actually pressing problems. So we spent a long time talking about the uh, allegedly devastating consequences of climate change while taking our eye off the ball of potential pandemics and the COVID-19 pandemic and, and things that pose a genuine threat to human health or a genuine challenge to Western societies and other societies, which is the question of how you deal with a novel virus and how you try to prevent it from impacting too harshly on society. Sorry to interrupt, but I, I wouldn't like the, the listener to go away with the impression that I was out there in the wilderness crying about pandemics for the last 20 years. Yes. I made some some quite prophetic remarks about how we've got to watch out for viruses from bats 20 years ago, but I then became more reassured as swine flu and bird flu and Ebola failed to mount major pandemics. And I, and so I, you know, I don't have a track record of, of saying, no, 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 you should be worried about pandemics. Yeah. Uh, I wish I did have. So this isn't me saying, I told you so. This is me saying the world got this wrong. Absolutely. Including and myself. Yes. Uh, I think there are many people who got it wrong. And I think in some ways it's understandable that people got it wrong because we were so, we were encouraged or cajoled, in fact, and pressured into focusing on uh, the climate change catastrophe and the coming apocalypse and the eco apocalypse that very often the attention of um, bodies that ought to be devoted to looking at the possibility of pandemics, particularly the World Health Organization and, and Western governments more broadly, their attention was distracted from potential threats into this kind of existential threat, which in many ways was magicked up by essentially Western elites that had lost faith in human progress. But one of the things that in your response to the, my previous question, one of the things you said was the problem of regulation. And I wanted to ask you specifically about the relationship between freedom and innovation, because this is one thing that you talk about quite a lot. And I think it's an incredibly important point, which is that the more red tape you have, or even the more censorship you have, or, or the more that society 
demonizes risk taking, demonizes experimentation, or looks upon those things as being somehow problematic or destructive, the more likely you are to negate innovative discoveries or discovery more broadly. So I, I wanted to ask you specifically about how important you think freedom in the broadest sense possible is to the process of innovation. Well, it, it's quite interesting because I'd, I'd written pretty well all the book and I was unable to summarize it into an elevator pitch. One often can't at that stage, yeah. actually. <laughs> and I asked a friend to read it, John Constable, who's a very uh, intelligent person. And he said, you know, what your elevator pitch is, is freedom. Everything you've said that encourages innovation is basically about freedom, and everything you've said that discourages it is is about lack of freedom. So it's the freedom of the consumer to express his wishes for a new technology through the market. But it's also the freedom of the producer to go out and satisfy those wishes and to do so by experimenting. And experimenting is, by definition, a free behavior, as it were, and it's terribly important to be able to change your mind, change direction. Most innovators do at some point. They set off in one direction and end up going in another. There's a huge amount of serendipity. You're looking for one thing, you come up with another. There are people who come in from unexpected directions and solve your problem from outside your field, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to understand that you need freedom to play and to try things and to fail and start again. You can tell the history of Amazon, the company, as a series of disastrous failures. I mean, it, it screwed up badly in the dot-com boom of the 90s. It got all sorts of things wrong, and then it would always pick itself up and start again. And that's because Bezos gets this. I mean, I've talked to him about it, and he's really interesting on it, you know, that, that the important thing is – to keep swinging and missing because one day you'll swing and hit. I believe that's a baseball metaphor. I don't quite understand it, but it's pretty obvious, isn't it, <laughs> what he's talking about? <laughs> so in that sense, it is, to my mind, to a considerable extent uh, about freedom. The, the freedom to innovate is absolutely crucial. And can I just come back to China with respect to that? Because people often say to me, and I do take this on in the book, well, hang on, you just said freedom's important for innovation. The most innovative society at the moment is probably China. China has no freedom, right? And the answer is China has no political freedom, but it has had, since Deng Xiaoping at least, considerable economic freedom. The bargain that Deng Xiaoping reached with the Chinese people was, as long as you don't challenge the Communist Party, as long as you're not a political innovator, then you can pretty well do what you like. If you contrast a British entrepreneur who wants to set up a factory to make a new widget in Britain uh, and has got to get you know planning permission and go through every, every kind of regulatory hurdle to get there with what a Chinese person has to do, the latter is far freer. Now, I think Xi Jinping is killing that. I think he is getting rid of freedom, just as the Ming emperors got rid of freedom after the Song emperors. Well, there was a Mongol interruption between, but the, the Song were, were very good at delegating and devolving, and they got the printing press and the compass and gunpowder and paper money and all these different things. And the Ming invented pretty well nothing because they – basically said that every merchant must report once a week to a Mandarin and tell them what they're going to do next. I, I exaggerate, but not much. And so I think China is sort of the exception that proves the rule. China ha has been surprisingly free beneath the level of politics. And we will see whether Xi Jinping's much more authoritarian approach to economics results in that petering out. My final question for you, Matt, is about failure and the positivity of failure, the, the usefulness of failure. And, and I always think of the Samuel Beckett line, you know, if you fail, that's fine. Fail again and fail better. And I, I wonder if one of the problems with contemporary society is that we're a bit scared of failure. And if something doesn't work 
very quickly we kind of give up or, or shrug our shoulders and go off and do something else. And I think one of the things that you touch upon very well is the importance of failure to the broader project of innovation and to the broader project of progress in the sense that, you know, this requires experimentation, risk taking, coming up with new ideas, some of which won't work and some of which hopefully will work, all of which will involve the process of failure. So I wonder, just to finish off, if I could ask you if if you agree with Samuel Beckett about the importance of fail- failure and failing better as we go along on the road to progress and innovation. Yes, I do think that's important. And I think this is one of California's secret sources. In other words, the way the rules were set up around bankruptcy and things like that in California so that people would fail fast and fail often, I think is the expression they use, was really important in allowing Silicon Valley to happen. I don't think it would have happened without some of that tolerance of failure. Some It was almost a badge of honor at one time in Silicon Valley to have, uh, you know, I started two companies, but they've both gone bust, but this time I'm going to get it right. And the, the venture capitalists were, were reassured because they knew that you understood what could go wrong, <laughs> which they wouldn't be in this country uh, or in Europe more generally. So I do think that some kind of tolerance of failure. Now, obviously, that's dangerous. If you tolerate failure too much, you open the door to fraudsters and, and fakers and people are going to fail every time. And I have a chapter in the book called Frauds, Fakes, Failures and Fads. And I talk about, for example, the story of Theranos, this extraordinary blood testing startup in Sil- that became the darling of Silicon Valley with an unbelievable galaxy of senior politicians on its board and was uh, worth $9 billion at one point. Uh, point yeah and well it made its founder a billionaire and it had nothing i mean it was you know the technology just didn't respond to that but it was modeling itself elizabeth holmes the founder was modeling herself on steve jobs because steve jobs sailed pretty close to the wind quite often he would adopt this philosophy which edison did too interestingly which was fake it till you make it you announce that you're going to be able to achieve such and such a goal before you've actually proved that you can achieve it. What bailed Steve Jobs out was Moore's law, was the incredible shrinking of the cost of computing and the increasing reliability as transistors became smaller, which is an unusual phenomenon and doesn't happen in every industry and certainly doesn't happen in blood testing. You know, the smaller the sample you take out of someone's finger, the the less reliable the test. So failure is important. We must allow failure to happen. We all learn from our failures. I've learned from my failures. And it makes you a more innovative person next time. But you can't go too far in that direction, obviously. So getting the balance right between allowing failure and not allowing catastrophic failure is obviously important. Matt Ridley, thank you very much. Brendan, it's always nice to talk. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. We'll be back with another guest and more discussion. Don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, keep reading Spiked at www.spiked-online.com.